you condescended to us 400 years ago you condescended to us 300 years ago you condescended to us 200 years ago you condescended to us 100 years ago you're condescending to us today you only know condescension because for you colonialism isn't something that happened in the past and we defeated we defeated you it's not that for you colonialism is a permanent condition Harry Kissinger, he kind of foresaw that Biden administration would extensively back to the world order system, world order system, which is also mentioned time and times by Lincoln. It's kind of interesting that recently in an interview, he said that the U.S. alleged Chinese aiming for global hegemony. On the other hand, bi-party media had been and has been further intensified fabricating coming collapse of China. How do you see the rise and collapse duality when global north look at China? or india look firstly i think that a lot of these stories about the rise and fall not useful um you know they come from a book published in 1776 the rise and fall of the roman empire by edward <laughs> gibbons it's a great book it's a, it's a really powerful read i remember you know when when fidel castro and che guevara were up in the sierra maestra fighting um against the forces of batista They had a copy of Edward Gibbon's Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire and they read it over and over again uh, because they only had three or four books they had a Emil Zola novel they had a readers digest and so on um but that was one of them anyway rise and fall history doesn't work like that as such you know the dynamics are much more complicated um take the case of china you know um china had a kind of its own development path until about the 1820s disrupted by occupations invasions all kinds of chaos but when you look at the situation in the 1820s or thereabouts it had one of the largest economies in the world it had a very important place in the eco- economic world of asia at the time then arrived the british with a very powerful naval fleet you know the chinese could have had a powerful naval fleet in the 14th century with cheng ho and and all that but they decided well we're not interested the land is more important in the mughals had the same attitude in india the mughal uh, empire developed a navy in gujarat and then they scuttled it they said no nah, land revenue is the main thing not trade overseas It's trade very interesting well, that the chinese fleet and the indian they both decided to just show off rather than to conquer some of it has to do with scale britain is a uh-huh. very small island and yeah, you yeah, know yeah. portugal is a very small territory Spain is also comparatively very small these become and and then Holland is even smaller these become the main maritime powers uh, these are tiny little places uh, but anyway let's not get into that the, the main thing here is britain comes and in a sense uh, uses its naval power to in i think chinese historians call the era of humiliation you know uh, the two opium wars and so on yeah. all the way out in a way all the way out to um 1949 you know it's a very long period and i know it's a period of struggle as well as uh, humiliation it's not just humiliation uh, but it was a period when the economy was really cut down and then from 1937 marco polo bridge till 49 it was in chaos in the middle of a war so china struggled and, and suffered and then from 49 there's been an amazing recovery um in a way from 1820 to 1949 you have to leap you know that was a, a period of of a trough and then you make a leap there's no decline and fall countries struggle to humanize themselves you know to to increase the well-being of their people i i i am one of those old fashioned people that believe that human history has a kind of motive and one of the motives of human history is to improve the lot of human beings also to learn to deal with nature uh, we've done a really bad job dealing with nature but we're learning but to improve the lot of human beings it's a, something we strive for you know uh, we go back to the buddha for instance uh, buddha looks out of his window sees suffering and says we have to go beyond suffering i think that's part of the driving force of human history i might be old fashioned here but i i believe there is a a logic to how humans interact with each other if that's the case then the question of rise and fall is not relevant because we are not looking at human history from the point of view of empires we're looking at human history from the point of view of emancipation and in that case rise and fall is irrelevant to me look henry kissinger is a very intelligent man and i think he's been a little misunderstood in china 
even his book on china is a little misunderstood because what kissinger was arguing was he was trying to answer a problem how should the united states maintain its power in the world and the question he asked himself was there would be two challengers to the united states that could not be easily subordinated europe could be easily subordinated the two challengers were russia and china and he argued in he got into the middle of a debate in us foreign policy circles of how to subordinate china and russia and some people said in the clinton administration that you have to actually befriend russia when yeltsin was the president boris yeltsin from 1991 to 90, 1999 befriend russia and break the link between russia and china don't allow them to come closer that was one side of the clinton administration the kind of pro russia side kissinger came in with the opposite side having been instrumental in the so called opening up of china in 1972 kissinger argued that no befriend china russia is more dangerous because they can endanger europe and so on so this is the debate that shapes kissinger he's not a friend of china he is merely saying befriend china to really undermine russia so that the united states can be very much more powerful in this debate what's forgotten is that china has its own history russia has its own history these are countries that are seeking in a sense respect and emancipation more china than russia if i can be honest with you because the chinese have an agenda to eradicate poverty not allow social inequality and so on that's not the case in russia you know it's not the case right now they don't have a poverty eradication agenda and so on china this is a fundamental issue doesn't matter the point is they are seeking respect on the world stage a german admiral vice admiral um k and antrim i think his name is schonberg goes to delhi on january 21st this year january 21st yeah we heard about that a speech okay in the speech <laughs> he merely says that we should treat we meaning the west should treat putin with respect that's all he said he had to resign from his position because it's it's not possible to say that either vladimir putin head of government in russia it's unacceptable to say that they should be treated with respect that's it nobody's saying anything about rise and fall you you raise the rise and fall i'm talking about human emancipation and respect even respect is not permitted 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 because he was fired he lost his job he has a career i looked into his career he has a career that is completely above board he's not one of these generals who says crazy things one or two examples there were in the past where he said things slightly outside the mainstream you know what he said actually that really bothered the ukrainians he said that crimea cannot be taken back by ukraine it's a fait accompli okay that's a factual statement that's not a moral judgment it's a fait accompli don't misunderstand me i don't mean that it's okay to go to war against panama it's not okay to go to war against any country but least of all countries with nuclear weapons you know with with high speed missiles and so on don't fool around there it's very dangerous um for the united states to up the in a sense temperature in the south china sea and suggest that you know it's willing to go to war against china that is insanity that is insanity i mean i'm saying it quite plainly some people really believe that though that's that's why i asked you that question the duality it's kind of joke in china right now but i don't know i'm not aware if you know that we say it like a probably new york times or uh, washington post um monday wednesday and friday they would argue that china is the biggest rival and on tuesday thursday saturday they say we're going to collapse tomorrow and on sunday they say stuff about a uh, human rights so the duality they can make this smooth transition i mean on monday your biggest rival and on tuesday you're going to collapse tomorrow it's kind of something to do with the you know media monopoly i would use that word and the uh, uh, german general of course i even followed his i think the last twitter after he's resigned like self defending ah, i don't mean that and stuff it's very yeah. interesting and how do you view the duality changing so fast and people really believing that they were going to have war with china out of nowhere how do you view that i mean look it's shameful that the journalistic profession um is not more uh, vigilant about things but i don't blame journalists because when you file a story your editor is the one who you know is the gatekeeper 
Well, it's shameful that editors don't stand up for integrity, but then editors answer to publishers who own newspapers and are therefore part of a ruling elite and have a certain bandwidth of what's acceptable. So you can't really blame journalists and editors. I mean, people have to make a living. You know, it's like being in a factory. You know, you can't blame the <laughs> yeah, worker yeah, yeah. Industry, if yeah, there's I'll a problem with the product, right? Um, but I still do because it's shameful that people, you know, uh, are putting this kind of stuff. They know you'd have to be cognitive dissonance between Tuesday and Monday uh, not to know that there's something wrong here, that how can you say it's dangerous on Monday and it's going to collapse on Tuesday? <laughs> so, I mean, there's something wrong here, okay? That's one. Secondly, why is this something that the audience is willing to accept? Um, this has got a lot to do with the kind of the sewer line of news. You know, uh, you just, when you look at, if you ever, I, I did my PhD on, on, on workers, sanitation workers, and I had the misfortune of looking into sewers a lot with the workers. You know, I, I, when I was doing my dissertation, a sewer is an incredible thing. You know, you've got all this garbage going down in a slurry Mm -hmm. underneath the, the street and it goes in enormous volume it's not slow it's very fast moving news has become like that mainstream news it's become like a sewer a slurry look there's this look there's that look over there look over here there's so much stuff going on people are not able to focus take a step back and the 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 in a sense the sewage line relies upon uh, forms of predetermined um, lack of trust in in the so-called other side. If you are taught very early, China is an authoritarian country, don't trust the Chinese, all of that, then you can say contradictory things. It doesn't matter because at the bottom, you're not focusing on, oh, it's a rival, oh, it's going to collapse. What you're focusing on, they're bad people. And I think that really is how you have to understand these contradictions that oh, what all these stories have in common is that China is a threat. That's what all these stories have in common. Whether it's going to be a rival or it's going to collapse, both stories in common have the idea that it's a threat. And, you know, it's a threat, so thank God it's going to collapse. It's a threat. We have to be very careful. You see, in both cases, what's in common is the threat. So all these stories do is they keep telling the reader, it's a threat, it's a threat, it's a threat. And it creates a kind of paranoia in the reader. So you're not focusing on the logic of things, you know, oh, it's going to collapse. You think, oh, I hope it'll collapse. It's a threat. Oh my God, they're going to attack us. It's a threat. That's the thing in common. And I think that's the reason why it doesn't matter what the news stories are about. It's what Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman call manufacturing consent. Uh, the way the news media functions actually creates an image in your head of mm -hmm. how you should see certain things. You know, that's too bad. You know, it's too bad. I, I am, I have a great honor and faith in the journalistic profession. You know, I think it's a, it's a very noble and good profession. A lot of good things can be done there. You know, for instance, we are having effectively a journalistic conversation. Um, we're trying to be as honest and sincere as possible, talking about very complicated things, right? I think this is a good model for journalism, sincerity. You know, we are not trying to say, be very afraid. No, I said something. I said earlier that um, I divided things up saying some places life is precious, some life is... And you said, wait a minute, hold on. I know of examples even inside the West where life is treated as disposable. That's a conversation, you know, that illuminates things for a reader. We're not coming out here with a big flashing neon sign, threat, threat, <laughs> threat. <you know. laughs>